Welcome to the Book Club Girl podcast, where we chat about great books with awesome authors, and you, our listeners, get to ask the questions. I'm Tavi Kowalchuk, and today we're reading a really fun book that's set in an office, which got me thinking about other books I've read that are set in an office. And I couldn't think of one, but one that I heard that's really good is Severance by Ling Ma. It's a novel that came out during the pandemic and it is also partially set in an office. And there's a little bit of book publishing I hear as well. So that's definitely one that I could check out to complete this category on my reading list. And I'm Bianca Flores. Tavia, I read Severance and it's so good. So it didn't come out during a pandemic, but it is a pandemic novel. And oh. so a lot of people were taught, yeah, a lot of people were talking about it during the, of course, during the pandemic in the beginning. So it feels very, you know, of the pandemic. But it's so funny that you mentioned that one because, you know, it partially takes place in publishing. And one of the books that I was thinking of that took place in an office is another publishing book. I thought of Luster by Raven Leilani, mm. which happens, you know, to be one of the most, I mean, incredibly absorbing reading experiences I've ever had. It's like incredibly evocative and addictive. And of course, since it takes place in publishing, I found it really fun to dip into. I cannot wait to talk about this workplace rom-com. And it's about an arch nemesis relationship that evolves from rivalry to love. And later in the show, we'll be joined by USA Today bestselling author Sally Thorne. Oh, I'm so excited. So before we dive into this week's episode, we also want to share one of our book club girl reviews from a listener who calls herself old lady book club girl. She writes to us, I had been receiving book club girl emails for some time before I decided to try the podcast. Imagine my surprise to find out how young the girls are considering that I'm 70 and we read the same books. The formula for the episodes is perfect. You know, synopsis, interview with questions and an audio excerpt. The girls are excellent in reviewers and are careful not to give away spoilers. They don't put themselves too much into their interviews, but let the authors take the lead and say what they want to about their books. And the audio excerpt usually sells me on the book. One bit of constructive criticism, the T in often is silent. I am totally guilty for this. I definitely pronounce the T. Um, but with that said, uh, we appreciate your feedback, old lady book club girl, and thank you so much for listening. I love that our listeners are all ages and now I have to go back and listen. Am I the offender or was it Eliza? Do I say often or often? I think I say I, often. <laughs> I feel I like know. I'm an offender. I definitely say the T. You do. <laughs> I do. Well, I appreciate the tip. I'm always happy to sound smarter than I actually am. Me too. <laughs> so with that said, we now present to you The Hating Game, Abridged. Lucy and Josh are both attractive, smart, intimidating people who are working for the same publishing company. Their desks face each other, and yet they cannot stand the sight of each other. Every day is filled with snarky comments and rude expressions. This is a hating game they seem to enjoy playing. They act like most people wish they could to some of their coworkers. An opportunity within the company arises, so naturally Lucy and Josh are up for the competition. The opportunity is a really exciting new job. They decide that if one of them gets the job, the other has to quit theirs. Soon enough, their hateful tension reveals itself in an unexpected moment of passion, and they find themselves in a position, no pun intended, they never thought they would be in. A moment of unexpected passion leads to more, a lot more, an invite to his brother's wedding, and Lucy is now wondering if she has ever hated Josh at all. Maybe he doesn't hate her either, or maybe this is just another version of their game. It's all delightfully confusing. So, Bianca, what did you think of the book? Oh my goodness, Tavia, I love this book so much. So it's the second time I've read it. And honestly, it's still my favorite rom-com. Um, she really takes, you know, the idea of comedy to a whole new level. Even though it's the second time I read it, I found myself laughing, you know, just as much, if not more. And it's really stuck with me in like more ways than just it being funny. Like, for example, like whenever I'm sad, I like to think of Lucy and Josh at Sky Diamond Strawberries or a villa in Tuscany. 
just to bring me some extra joy. I love it. Oh my gosh. No, I totally agree. She brings this like next level energy of the enemies to lovers trope. It is just pure rom-com goodness. It reminds me of some of the early, early books that came out in the genre before it was called rom-com when they used to call it mm. chick lit. Dare I say it out loud? (laughs) But the repartee between Lucy and Josh was amazing. And up until the very end, I still didn't know who was going to get the job of CFO and how – or COO, I think it was COO, and how it was all going (laughs) to work out. I know. I think it's funny, right? Because, you know, with these rom-coms, you kind of you kind of know slash suspect that they're going to end up together and it's going to be great and all of that. But – we didn't really know who was going to get the job or anything like that. So I feel like that was really smart for her to weave that in, you know, that extra business storyline for extra like suspense and tension. I mean, it was just brilliant. (laughs) I agree. And I so enjoyed the publishing house setting. I mean, it is unrealistic the way that they went from being assistants to the CEO to being (laughs) a COO. Like that is like, really, you're going to consider your assistant for a COO position. (laughs) Okay, I would like that job trajectory. Um, But I really laughed so hard when when that was presented as like a possibility. (laughs) I was going to say, I feel like there are so many reasons why I want this book to be real, just because I love the idea of like such true passion and love. But that's definitely another reason why I wanted the book to be real. I'm like, yes, let's all just be promoted into like these big glamorous positions, you know, like let's <laughs> let's just do it. Like, come on, give it to us, Sally. <laughs> Have you ever talked to a COO? I don't think it's very glamorous, actually. <laughs> <laughs> At least that there's this level of importance, right? So <laughs> that makes me that brings me joy. I loved the ending in the book. I loved it so much. There was only one yeah. one thing I thought was missing in the book at the very end that isn't necessary, but it just would have been satisfying to me as a reader. I'm not mm-hmm. going to say it. I don't want to ruin anything for people who haven't read the book. To all of our listeners, please join us as we toast each other. Cheers to you, Bianca, as we get ready to talk to our guest, Sally Thorne, in just a minute. Yay. Cheers. So we love hearing from our listeners. You can rate and review the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you're listening to this episode. And you can also participate in conversations about great books in the lively comment section of our Instagram feed at Book Club Girl. Today, we're joined by Sally Thorne, whose book, The Hating Game, is out now. Welcome, Sally, to the Book Club Girl podcast. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Joining you here from Australia. Hello. Oh, love it. We're so happy to have you. All right. So let's get right to it, Sally. Of course, the hating game uses the enemies to lover trope. But what I actually want to talk to you about first is friendship. So one of the parts that I found, you know, really most touching is towards the beginning of the book. Lucy simply wishes she and Josh could be friends. I just found that so touching. Can you tell us a little bit about how the idea of friendship plays a role in the book? Well, I guess The Hating Game is really, to a large extent, a story about loneliness and two lonely people that have made their work their priority. And... They are looking for friends. Lucy lost a lot of her friends in the merger and Josh is just too intimidating and imposing to make friends, I assume. And in a way, I think both styles of people can be hard to get to know. Lucy is really, you know, probably a pretty over-the-top friend and, you know, she's a a cupcake bringer and a a people pleaser. So they're, they're at different ends of the spectrum. And I think both types of people probably might have trouble making real friendships. That's so true. I didn't think about how they approach friendship so differently, right? And I feel like it's kind of that whole opposites attract idea that kind of falls into friendship as well as, as you know, the whole the whole love angle to this. I could really relate to her desire to be friends with someone in the office. Sometimes it just isn't reciprocated, your desire to have friendship. And so I could I could relate to her her wish that that he would just be nice to her. Oh, that's so true. <laughs> One of the things that I loved about this book was the way that you used setting to define the characters. 
for example, like the office is really hostile. It has all shiny, hard, echoey surfaces. But yet Lucy's apartment is a total mess and not really decorated very much. And Josh's is, you know, it's like an interior designer went in and took care of it. And of course, it's neat as a pin. Why did you choose these settings for the three primary environments? I guess in a book where much of the storyline takes place in three rooms, you have to differentiate them. And really, I often think that this book would have been a great play. Like, it has such few settings. I can really imagine it on a stage just with those three simple sets. I mean, I know that they go to a wedding off-site later, but for most of the book, the office is the entire world. And Mm -hmm. I think the, the hardness and the shininess of the office just is to highlight that Lucy does not feel comfortable there yet. The two sides of the company have merged and moved into this new building and it's just like a totally alien environment for her. So just to keep her feeling a little bit off kilter, she's in a place that she doesn't feel comfortable and she has to sit opposite someone who is like an emotionless robot. But, (laughs) you know, a person's private space is a glimpse into their own inner life. I think. So that's why we see Lucy's is a bit of a mess. Josh's is almost too neat. I don't know. When you're writing a book, you just try to use any tool that you can to color in the world. And yeah, I'm glad you picked up on those elements that I wrote. Yeah, I feel like there are so many details when it comes to the settings that they really feel like characters in themselves. But now I need the hating game, the play. <laughs> I need I need the play for this now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Broadway next coming 2023. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes, please. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> So every now and then our listeners submit questions for the podcast, and we got a ton of questions for The Hating Game. Our listeners were totally into this. So we picked some of the best ones for you. Janessa, her question is, romance novels have a lot of tropes. What are your favorite romance tropes as an author? And how do you keep that trope fresh and new when writing it more than once? My favorite trope overall is false proximity. If the back of the book says these two people are going to get trapped down a mine shaft for three weeks together, I'll buy that book. <laughs> <laughs> so all of my books, all three that are published, all have a forced proximity element to it. I like keeping it all in one world. I like to keep them in those four walls together. And I think what I do best is two characters in a room staring at each other. Like that's kind of my wheelhouse. So in terms of how you keep it fresh each time, I guess I personally, you'll probably have noticed that each book is different to the last. When I wrote The Hating Game, I had to make a decision. Like, am I just going to keep writing The Hating Game or a variant of The Hating Game over and over again? Or am I going to write things that are really different? So for me, it was really important to always write really different things because every job I've ever had, I got really bored really fast. So this is the coolest job in the entire world, and I never want to get bored. Sally, we were saying earlier when we were talking about about The Hating Game, just me and Bianca, how much we both loved the dialogue that between Lucy and Josh. And I think Now that you say, you talk about the false proximity trope and putting the characters in this like confined space, I can totally see how that would beget this incredible dialogue that you wrote for them. I just think they have the best dialogue. I mean, your dialogue is is amazing. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. In the first few drafts of The Hating Game, the dialogue wasn't very good at all. Um, And when I read through it, it was many, many pages of just Lucy's internal dialogue. Um, So in redrafts, I had to really focus on the dialogue because it wasn't something that I was strong at. Um, So The Hating Game is an example that if you just continually focus in on something that you know that is not your strength and you just keep trying to refine it, eventually it'll come good. It's so funny. It's it's hard to think that the dialogue was never like had a moment where it wasn't good because to me it just reads so organic and you know smooth that it's weird to think that you had to work hard on it. I'm like it it feels like it just flew right out of you. <laughs> That's funny to think. 
You're listening to the Book Club Girl podcast, where our guest this week is Sally Thorne, and whose book, The Hating Game, is out now. You can read more about Sally's books at bookclubgirl.com. And coming up on the Book Club Girl podcast, we asked Sally about her affinity literary character. Stick around. This episode of the Book Club Girl podcast is brought to you by our friends at the Pop Fiction Women podcast. Hi, I'm Kate. And I'm Corinne of the podcast Pop Fiction Women. Did you know Sally Thorne's novel The Hating Game is now a movie? We love adaptations. We have episodes on Normal People, Nine Perfect Strangers, The Queen's Gambit, The Flight Attendant. And this spring, we're discussing Sally Rooney's Conversations with Friends. It's not only adaptations on Pop Fiction Women. We deep dive into our favorite books, TV shows, and movies, and the women behind them. Find Pop Fiction Women wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to the show. Each week, we bring you a fascinating new conversation with an author who's written a book we think is a great choice for book clubs to read together. Today, best-selling author Sally Thorne is here with us answering questions about her romance novel, The Hating Game. I loved that fact when Lucy stood up for herself, and I took it as emblematic that that she acted this way once, so therefore she had the strength to do it going forward. Another favorite scene that I had in the book was when Josh took care of Lucy when she got the food poisoning after paintball. It was such a satisfying scene to read and to be immersed in. They each dropped their defenses, and I just wanted more of that. Did you have fun writing that scene? And what was your favorite scene in the book to write? Well, six scene is a, a very popular trope, of course. Um, there's quite a few tropes in this book. And I love six scenes. I love I love that he got to come into her apartment and see the true chaos that was there. And initially when I was drafting it, I started to write it that Josh had the food poisoning. But I, I probably just drafted the scene out with him being sick (laughs) but it just didn't work because Mm -hmm. we are in Lucy's head for the entire book and (laughs) we have to experience the true mortification of waking up the next morning and hastily putting that armor back on and (laughs) throwing him out of her apartment um, to step to get them to take a step back because this book is this book is a big game and it's a big two steps forward one step back throughout the whole thing it was nice to see him being his true self, which was tender and caring and drawing on his own previous skills of how to take care of a sick person and what he's mm-hmm. learned from his parents, I'm sure, because they were doctors. I loved every single word of that scene. Oh, me too. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so speaking of scenes, our fans are curious about your thoughts on the Hating Game movie, and they would like to know, you know, what were your favorite scenes in the adaptation of the novel? Well, I loved it, and I can honestly say that. I was scared when I got the rough. I was scared, but also I I knew that I hadn't set out to write a movie. You know, if I'd wanted to write a movie, I should have Um, gone to a screenwriting class and written my own script. I didn't. I wrote a book. And this was a whole big other team's take. And they've taken my book and they've been inspired by it. I've obviously read the script and had a chance to make notes on it. And I knew that it was really close to the book. And so Mm -hmm. when I watched it, I just loved it. It was my only chance to be like you guys and to experience the story for the first time myself as a audience member rather than seeing right. everything that happened behind the scenes of me trying to tie this big tapestry together. So I loved it. I felt like it was really true to the book. It kept that kind of quiet weirdness to it, kept the, the office as the world. And <laughs> my favorite scene um, was definitely the paintball scene because I loved that it was snowing when they were filming. I had quite a few people write to me saying, I think they've made an error. There was no snow mentioned in the book. And I'm like, well, guys, like they have to work with what they've got. And it looked great. The visual of the white snow and, you know, like the paintballs. And I just thought it was such a cool take. I loved it. And I also loved any scene that the character of Danny was in. 
that actor just totally stole the whole movie for me. He was a scene stealer. He was so funny and awkward and yes. such a, a great alternative option for Lucy presenting as like a really viable love triangle. So I mm-hmm. thought they did a great job and I loved it. My mum loved it and that's the most important thing. She had a blast. Um, so, yeah. Yay. I love that you mentioned Danny because I also thought I just liked the way they adapted him into the movie so much. I totally agree. He's so awkward, but also like charming. I just thought it was a really nice fit. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So we have two other questions about the movie. Thanks to Alana, Elizabeth, and Melissa, our listeners. So those questions are, is there any part of the book that didn't make it into the movie that you wish they did include? And if you could make one change about the movie, what would it be? You no, know, I think that they got all of the high points, all of the, the good scenes into the movie. There's an entire scene in the book where they just sit on the couch and watch a TV show. And even when I was writing the book, when I finally had an editor, oh, yeah. I was like, that scene's going to be the first one to go. No one's going to read a chapter about people watching TV. But the editor was like, it kind of works <laughs> in a weird way. <laughs> she let me have it and I was like oh okay so I mean I guess if I had to say like (laughs) what I would have enjoyed their interpretation of I guess it would have been the tv watching scene (laughs) where they sit there in silence and then hold hands and then she goes home (laughs) but you can see why things like that may not translate so well into a, a movie scene yeah and Oh, I mean, obviously, I couldn't travel to be there. I couldn't do a set visit. I, I, I would have if I could have. So, I mean, if I could change anything, I would totally have been in the bookshop, like doing a bit of a Stephanie Meyer in Twilight cameo, like maybe oh, I yes. was in the background selling a coffee or something like that, or maybe delivering oh, a parcel gosh. in the background, or it could be the receptionist at B&G. That's what I wish I could have changed. I wish I could have been there and experienced it in person. Well, congratulations on the success of the book and and on the movie being made. And I just can't wait to see the buzz sort of bubble up all over. I've already seen some really funny TikToks. So I think I think it's going to be good. So I'm already like dying to read all of your books, Sally. So your latest book, 99% Mine, was, of course, another success. So we've got to hear, are there any other future projects we can get excited about? My next book is a bit of a a right-hand turn from my first three books. I think most authors wrote a really strange book during lockdown and I was no exception. So I presented my editor with a book entitled Angelica Frankenstein Makes Her Match. And everything you need to know about it is in the title. Victor Frankenstein, who we of course know in Literary Hall of Fame. Thank you, Mary Shelley. I had a random idea one day. What if he had a sister? And while he was doing his um you know, world changing experiments, he was helping her to basically make a husband. And I just really went for it. And it's a, it's historical, it's set in 1814. It's obviously a historical, hopefully it's funny. And um, it was inspired by my dollhouse, which is just behind me here. If you can see this dollhouse here. Yes, that's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, it's um, one of my passions. And so the house in the book is inspired by my dollhouse. Really had to work with what I had during lockdown and I was stuck in this room. So <laughs> um, I hope that people I hope people are open for it. It's going to come out in September of this year, which is sort of getting towards your fall and your spooky season. And yeah, it's a whole lot of vibes. And what would you do if you could build a man from the ground up? <laughs> oh, my gosh. That. They would take out the recycling. That's number one. <laughs> yes. Do the laundry. <laughs> take out the recycling. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) oh my gosh sally we have one final question for you every episode we ask an author if you could be any character from any novel who would you be okay this is a hard question obviously but i'm going to say i would be emma woodhouse in jane austen's emma i would love that life i would love to be a cute rich girl um living in my mansion just pop downstairs, have a cup of tea with my cute dad, and then just wander around the village all day long looking 
fine in my incredible outfit. Mr. Knightley would come over in the afternoons and we'd all sit around and laugh and have dinner and you'd get to look at him and I'd call the carriage whenever I wanted. I would have a lot of hot baths and I love that life for me. So that's my answer. <laughs> I love That's that life such for a you good too. Choice. I love that life for <laughs> <Yeah>. you. Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. We all need that life. Absolutely. Such a good choice. Um, <laughs> Sally, it was so nice to have you on the podcast. I am going to read The Hating Game for a third time now. So thank you uh, so much for joining us. Thank you so much. As I said at the beginning, we weren't recording, but I love this book so much. It was such a surprise to me, and I'm just so happy it came into my life. So thank you for joining us on the podcast, Sally. It was a real treat to talk about this book with you. Thank you, guys. That was Sally Thorne, whose book, The Hating Game, is out now. To find out more about The Hating Game and her new book, Angelica Frankenstein Makes Her Match, head to bookclubgirl.com slash podcast, where you can also find links to everything mentioned in this episode. Like what you heard? Subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, give us a rating and leave a review. Another way to help spread the word about the Book Club Girl podcast, tell a friend. It really helps others to find us. You'll hear from us again in one week, where we'll be speaking with Susan Elizabeth Phillips, author of the best-selling book, When Stars Collide. If you want to read the book before its podcast drops, head over to hc.com and use promo code BOOKCLUBGIRL for 25% off and free shipping for any book discussed on this podcast. That's all one word, Book Club Girl, all caps. And we love hearing from our listeners. Email us at thegirls at bookclubgirl.com or post in the comments on our Instagram feed at bookclubgirl. You can also leave us a voicemail. Our number is 212-207-7336. Your voicemail or email could very well end up being read on the show. Before we go, we'd like to thank Caroline Quash of The Hangar Studios who produced today's episode and our editor and audio engineer, Roselia Ryan. Until next time, I'm Bianca. And I'm Tavia. Happy reading. I'm vomiting. Joshua Templeman is holding a large Tupperware container under my face, the one I usually carry cakes to work in. I can smell the sweet plastic residue of icing and eggs. I throw up more. His wrist is holding up my limp head, my hair gathered in his fist. This is so disgusting. I groan in between heaves. I'm so, I'm so, shh, he replies. And I fall asleep, shuddering and gasping, while he wipes my face with something cold and damp. The clock says 1.08 a.m. when I sit upright again. A wet compress falls into my lap. I jerk in fright at the weight on the bed next to me. It's me, Joshua says. He's sitting against my headboard with his thumb in a Smurf Price guidebook. He's got no shoes on, and his socked feet are casually crossed at the ankles. The other books have been stacked neatly on my dresser. I'm so cold, I chatter. I put my hand into my hair. It's still damp from my shower. He shakes his head. You have a fever. It's getting worse. No, cold, I argue. I stumble into the bathroom, leaving the door ajar. I pee, flush, and then realize how unladylike I was. Oh well. He's seen and heard almost everything now. There's nothing left to do but fake my own death and start a new life. I use my finger to rub some toothpaste on my tongue. Gag. Repeat. I hear cotton unfurling, the snap of elastic, and the creak of mattress. And through the crack in the door, I watch him put fresh sheets on the bed. I'm a soggy, disgusting mess, but I still manage to watch his bent over backside. How you doing? He looks at me under his arm and hauls the last corner of the sheet into place. My lucky mattress is being manhandled. Oh, just fine. How you doing? I fall into bed and claw the blankets up onto me. The mattress depresses heavily beside me, and his hand is on my forehead. Ah, that's nice. His hand feels like the sort of temperature I should be striving for. 
everything we do is tit for tat. So I raise my hands up and put them on his forehead. Okay, he is amused. I'm touching my colleague Joshua on the face. I'm dreaming. I'll wake up on the bus with him sneering at the trail of drool on my chin. But a minute ticks by and I don't. I slide my hands down over sandpaper grit on his jaw, remembering how he cradled my face in the elevator. No one has ever held me like that. I open my eyes and I could swear he shivers. I touch his pulse. It touches me back. I have my hands on his throat now, and I remember how badly I wanted to strangle him once. I spread my hands lightly around his neck, just to check the fit, and he narrows one eye. Go ahead, he tells me, do it.